Hey everyone, and welcome back. This is the Happy Cat here, and I don't really have a filming setup anymore, which has been a barrier to me trying to make videos. I don't even really have a great screen recording software. Hopefully there's something interesting playing in the background of this. Uh, and also, every time I try to write some kind of script or talking points for a video, there's like, I, I get so much in my head, which I'll talk about later, that I like kind of self-filter way too much and nothing gets made. So I was like, well, if I'm starting to shelter in place today, I will just make this and get over all those mental hurdles and talk about how I've gotten over a lot of mental hurdles in the past year. Or I guess the last time I posted on here it has been like almost two years ago, which is crazy. Uh, I guess to rewind back then, I believe I made a video about, hey, I got this cool new job. And I had checked with the powers that be at that cool new job. Hey, I kind of do internet things. I make game dev content. Is that cool? And they all said, yes, that's totally fine. And um, so I was really excited and I had some stuff in mind. I think before that I was working on that little mystery game in Godot, the Godot engine. And in the meantime, right after I made my last video almost two, two years ago, that's crazy. Oh my God. Um, I was working on porting that same game to an engine in C Sharp. I wanted to write my own mystery game dialogue engine in C Sharp so it could plug into Unity and I could publish like a DLL that others could use. And I actually just kind of necroed, I like resurrected that project from my own GitHub and I actually have updated it to the latest Unity and I fixed some things. So I'm actually, who knows, maybe in quarantine I'll actually get to uh, finishing or getting a good chunk of that C Sharp engine done. Mainly, I wanted to switch over just because uh, in my normal day job, I have a really efficient workflow with Visual Studio C Sharp. Um, at that time, I still actually would have to look into it. Godot and C Sharp didn't seem to integrate in the ways that I really specifically wanted to. So anyways, and I wanted to just do a cool project and I thought it would make for good video content to show how I made this engine and my design principles and my thought process. And I think that still would be good content because I've already found it fun and educational to look back at code I wrote two years ago and see how much I've even improved uh, since then. So maybe look forward to that, but I can't even promise anything because I'm terrible and don't make things for years, apparently. Um, so that's where I was at. And that project, I'll, you can look at my commit history on that too. Uh, it's called Esky in my GitHub because uh, the Godot framework I was using was something that the uh, guys who made Godot used this Ascoria scripting language, and I believe that means like crap in Spanish because it's based off of the scum. The naming is based after scum, S-C-U-M-M, -M, which is what like Monkey Island and whatnot used, something like that. And then I just called it Esky for Ascoria plus happy, uh, like my username. Anyway, so you can look at my commit history. I was actually working on that in 2018. And then, you know, I think I probably, the way my brain works is I balloon the project to needing it to be too perfect or like too much bloat, like just bloating it out. And then I was like, well, you know, my videos are usually so low quality and I'm so bad at my filming setup and like Windows Movie Maker is deprecated. You know, I need to, I should come back with like a bang and I should uh, get like a real camera and do like a cool video. Like I live in Washington state. We have such cool scenery. It would be cool to do stuff even outside. Like I had all of these <laughs> honestly kind of like, Ideas that made the barrier to entry way too high to start making videos again. And then also software I had used in the past was just, yeah, slowly starting to get deprecated and I had to update my workflows and it just, <laughs> it just wasn't working out. And then also the stuff that I do day to day is just really different than what maybe an indie or uh, like viewer of this channel might 
find interesting or relevant to them. I think there are still things that people would definitely find interesting. But then I was also getting squirrely about like, well, I have approval from folks at the studio, but I also don't want to step on any toes or accidentally do absolutely anything that could jeopardize our project because it's not my work. It's like so many people's hard work uh, that I don't want to put at risk in any way whatsoever. And this was also before like a lot of things were announced and now more things have been announced. So I don't feel like I'm putting this top secret thing at risk by like existing on the internet and making my own content. I don't know. Anyways, there are just, you can see actually as I'm running through this with a different mindset, I'm like, wow, I had so many just like thoughts and worries and concerns and needing to be perfect and like, uh, uh, wanting to, if someone left a comment on my videos that was fairly criticizing or fairly correcting something. I wanted to like respond to each one and update my video. And I was getting really stressed out with the fact that I couldn't like keep everything up to date and make everyone happy. And I realized, well, that's true of a lot of things, not just YouTube. So you can either quit or you can learn to kind of cope with that and just try to do better next time, which at the time seemed impossible. And now it seems a little more possible to me. Um, anyway, so yeah, then um, that was 2018 for me. And then uh, in 2019, so I was basically just enjoying myself. I was enjoying my work. I was enjoying my personal life, doing different things. I picked up skiing again. I grew up in the Midwest uh, in the suburbs of Chicago where there really wasn't any skiing. So I'd only done it a couple times in my life. And I was really enjoying that out here in Washington, Seattle, there's local skiing on the weekends. That was so fun. And I picked up um, biking, like long distance cycling. There's beautiful places to go cycling in the summer out here. And then I was also, uh, as a kid, I had taken horseback riding lessons. They it's only for a couple years, kind of standard little kid stuff, depending on where you live. Uh, and it was super fun. I absolutely loved and appreciated it. But looking back, I know I it was very fairly basic. I didn't get to learn a lot of the nitty gritty of horsemanship, owning a horse, training them. It was just a lot of fun, which is fine because I was a kid. Um, and I soon after moving out to this area and getting a job in 2016 i for it was it's kind of cheesy i had a dream that i was riding a horse through the forest and then i woke up and i was like uh i haven't interacted with horses and farm animals in forever i want to go take lessons and that started this journey where first of all i realized if you've ever been in the seattle area specifically kind of the east side suburbs, it looks very developed out here. Like towns like Bellevue have sprung up into like the urban metropolises, uh, even Redmond where the main Microsoft campus is. The downtown of Redmond, you can tell, used to be a really uh, just sort of a farm, more rural town. Uh, there's right across the street from like a super trendy kind of millennial ice cream place. Uh, there's this like cowboy and Western wear shop, which I believe is going out of business now, but the cowboy and Western wear shop. And then there's like this ancient vacuum store. And you can tell that like that was old Redmond and new Redmond is like trendy coffee shops and ice cream and these modern apartments. Oh my God, there's apartments everywhere. Um, like modern luxury apartments that cost way too much in my opinion. But um but yeah, you sorry, you would never guess that this area used to be very horsey, be very rural. So there's lots of barns and places around here, much more so than even Illinois, which you think of Midwest, Midwestern America as kind of farm country. And even an hour outside of Chicago, you'd think, oh, well, surely there has to be some stuff. And there are, but they tended to be more expensive and kind of if you've been to horse barns, I would say I would describe an urban barn as one where the horses get small little paddocks to go outside or maybe they're staying inside all day, which I think is not so great. 
Uh, but there's no like rolling fields, uh, stuff like that. It's a very kind of dense couple acres of an urban barn space. And that's a lot of what was around where I grew up. We used to have to drive almost an hour to go across the border to Wisconsin. (laughs) I say across the border, like there's some Wisconsin border patrol. No, but, um, we used to drive up to Wisconsin from where we lived and that had more options. Uh, but around here, I've just been really, it's been really interesting to see more horsey people. So there were lots of options to choose from. And I had a couple that were duds and more of giving lessons like I had when I was a kid where you sort of get on a horse that knows its job. It will basically ignore you for better or worse. Like if you're doing things that are wrong, it won't really react. And on the other hand, if you're trying to ask it to do something more than what it usually does, it'll kind of ignore you too, because it's like, that's not part of the deal. Um, and yeah, so I found a couple, a couple of those duds. And then I met a trainer I really, really liked, who I had never learned kind of what dressage was, but I was very interested in it. Uh, it in French, I think means just training. The word for training is dressage. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it was basically the the summary of the principles used in the Western world to train horses for the military. So like if you go to museums and you see fancy European Western paintings of like a general on a huge horse, uh, generally those were warm bloods that are still to this day bred in Europe and people still like in the US will buy horses from Germany and the Netherlands specifically for these big bodied, super athletic uh, horses. I believe they're called warm bloods because they're hot blooded horses like Arabians and thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds are like what you'd see in race, uh, racetracks and draft horses. So they're very big and very athletic and they can jump and they're very flexible to do these intricate dressage movements. And um, the principles of dressage are to have, this is my personal definition just off the cuff, there's a lot to it, but kind of having the lightest communication possible and developing their body. Uh, It's kind of like physical therapy for the horse if you're doing it right. And it's also sort of the art of communicating with your horse with the most subtle and kind of artful movements as possible. And the application of it in war would be, uh, so for example, if you watch the Olympics, which are now unfortunately postponed, but if you watch Olympic dressage, you'll notice Okay, they're kind of trotting off. It looks like the rider's not doing much, (laughs) um, which means that they're doing their job right. But the horse will kind of move laterally to the side and you'll see its legs cross. And that can be a couple different movements, but that's like a leg yield or a half pass. And you can imagine in battle, if an enemy starts like uh, hurling their pike at you, I don't know, I'm bad at this, like stabbing you with their pike, imagine that you could, with just a light bump of your leg, send your horse to the side to dodge and be nimble and maneuverable, and that they could pivot around with just a change in your body weight and things like that. So it makes a lot of sense why you'd want a military horse to be so responsive and uh, collected and have all of their muscles developed symmetrically and things like that. So I found all of this so fascinating and so cool. And yeah, it's just this super niche ancient European martial art that dates back to texts from the first ancient Greeks in Western society that started to train horses. And it's super expensive. There's a very high barrier to entry. Uh, I'm aware fully, and we'll get into it, of the associated elitism with equestrian sports. And even just the high barrier to entry of if you don't know someone who's into it, if your family's not into it, where it doesn't even cross your mind, like, how would I get started with that? Um, Like, even when I told people at work that I was getting a horse, they were like, where do you keep it? Don't you live in an apartment? And it was like... You know, there's a lot of places where you can keep a horse in the general east side area if you look for it. And it's just like 
people didn't even know, like, where would you put a horse? How would you get started with any of that? Um, and so that can be a huge barrier to entry, even if you do have money to literally light on fire every single month. Um, anyway, circling back. So I found a trainer who taught dressage in a way that I really enjoyed and that really forced me to think about kind of every muscle in my body, how, where my body weight was. If I was adding tension to the horse, uh, I worked with a really special lesson horse named Deb who uh, responded really well to the seat. And that just kind of means your body weight, the placement of your hip bones and your shoulders and how your spine is stacked. And so it was kind of funny because my first year of riding her, I had trouble even just, and keep in mind as a kid, I did all sorts of crazy stuff. I did walk, trot, canter, I jumped things. These were on like trained horses that were trained to let kids, you know, do that stuff with them. Uh, it's not like I was a super cool kid or anything. Uh, but with this horse, she was super well trained, super finely tuned for her job. And I was having trouble just walking and turning correctly because my this is where I first identified how asymmetrical my right side is from even just using a mouse every day, like that lifts your shoulder up a bit. And I realized as I had to spend like, honestly, a couple of years now untangling my right side, I have no major pain, no major issues or injuries, but just from kind of normal day-to-day -day asymmetries, uh, I really <laughs> had a huge difference according to the horse because every time I'd turn left, she'd basically follow me and I do what I felt was the exact same thing on the right side. And she'd almost always have even a kind of dramatic reaction, like, no, thank you. Don't want to go to the right. And I think it was because, well, I don't think I know now that like even the ball socket joint of my hip and like the glute and the front of my hip, like what you'd stretch when you do a lunge was like just so bunched up, all of that. Like when I started to do stretches to unravel that, I was like, whoa, my right side just feels gross compared to my left. So I'm sure as I thought, oh, I am relaxing down, that I was actually just this like ball of tension no matter how hard I tried because my weight and my tension was just distributed differently and I wasn't even aware of it. And uh, this is where one of my first huge lessons that I learned from this process was uh, maybe I'll throw up the graphic here, but when you're learning something, you start out not knowing what you don't know. It's just kind of like chaos. And so let's say I take one of you and I sit you up on a horse and you don't even know what you don't know. You're just kind of like, I'm up here on this horse figuring things out. And then if someone said, hey, your right side is off, you're kind of like, okay, now I know something I'm doing wrong. Uh, so now you know something that you don't know, but you still don't know how to fix it and you couldn't even point it out yourself. You're like, I didn't know my right side was bad. And then you move into, after doing it enough and having someone point it out to you, like, hey, you are you have too much tension on your right side. You're leaning too much to the right. Eventually you're like, oh, okay, I'm starting to click. when I When my body feels this way, the person points out that I'm doing this thing wrong. So now it becomes something that you actually know you're doing wrong and you can identify it and maybe even self-correct without someone telling you it. And then finally, that goes into muscle memory where it is no longer a problem. And that's the learning process for so many things, but it's absolutely identified in sports or activities where you're kind of just in the motion and like even skiing is another good example where you're in motion and you're just kind of having to correct yourself as you go along and eventually just get better and better. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I started to learn that principle. And that's where I also went to like chiropractors and physical therapists and things just because I was so mystified. Like I didn't know my right side was that bad. I had x-rays taken that just showed that like my, I think it's thoracic, like kind of the mid to upper uh, vertebrae on my spine were just totally stacked to the right. Even I went on a super long 
uh, cycling ride, or I guess it's not long, depending who you talk to. Some cyclists are crazy, but I went on like a 30, 40 mile bike ride. And afterwards, my whole right side was like blazingly sore while my left side almost, it almost felt like there was no muscle there. And that was another huge red flag of like, oops, I probably spent like two of those four hours just like leaning on my right side because it was stronger. And then that was when I actually looked in the mirror and I noticed that my left like waist just dipped in so much more than my right because there was just such a lack of muscle there from me not being, not having that awareness. Um, so that was one of those things that it sounds like, I don't know, it's my epiphany. Maybe it doesn't sound as cool just like saying it out, but it was where, once again, not to sound cheesy, but doing stuff like yoga where I had, I challenged myself to really try to be as balanced and symmetrical in poses as possible. Uh, that became an extremely helpful tool and not only managing my stress, like doing something mindful and slowing down, but also actually improving my body to do sports that I honestly could not have continued if I didn't make my body more symmetrical, because uh, that's what we were asking the horses to do, to be straight and symmetrical. So it's not very fair if I also suck. So that's another one of my principles that I take is that I won't ever ask an animal, specifically horses, to do something if I'm not already physically prepared. And even before I ride now, I will do a full yoga session to make sure I'm fully warmed up and that none of the tension will come from me. So if there's an issue, I do my best to isolate things so that I can help the horse out and that it's not my problem that I'm blaming the horse for. Anyway, so found this trainer, worked with this horse, Deb, who taught me these things about my body. She also had another brilliant, lovely guy named Dakota, who was a bit bigger and a little bit more, <laughs> you could kind of bump around on him. We joke, he's kind of like driving a bus because he's just so huge, but also so calm and sweet and forgiving and all that. But he was also less responsive to like the body weight thing. Um, so, you know, pros and cons there. Uh, but then I was thinking, so I mentioned to you guys how I was doing some game dev stuff. I had my job. I did some traveling over the last couple years. I did biking. I did skiing. But really, like, my favorite part of my week was doing stuff with horses once a week. That was just what made me happy. It was what, when there was a nice day, I was like, ah, oh, if I could spend the day with a horse, that would be amazing. And it was obviously kind of a childhood dream like I would always joke like could, like oh could you get me a pony for Christmas and then I'd get like a little plastic one dollar pony like ha 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 um but really uh I could do a whole nother conversation on like my thoughts on finances I learned a ton kind of going from a college student who was very scared about being employed to getting a tech salary and learning like, what do I do with this? How do I mentally like figure this out? And uh, for some people, I'll just say quickly, that can mean like overspending or kind of going nuts with it. I'd say for me, going from being like uh, my only money being from like grading papers in college to like actually having some stuff to work with was like, I just kept, my boyfriend and I both just kept kind of living like college students and we didn't really spend much and like, I still ride my bike to work, we cook in a lot, we like, I don't even buy many video games, maybe if I'm supporting some friends projects or uh, maybe there's one thing a year that I'm really hyped about, but really I've kind of Marie Kondoed consumption. Actually, that's a good point. I kind of Marie Kondo, like I deep clean my apartment and all of my belongings, maybe one, two, three times a year. I do it fairly often. And after a few rounds of that, like spending money has just like, or just not even spending money, just like consuming, shopping, things like that are kind of exhausting to me because I always think, is this just going to end up in a bin to be donated, which hopefully someone can use it, but you don't always know, are the donation places throwing it out? Because is this really usable and in good enough condition for someone else to use? 
Uh, or I have to throw it out and I feel bad. Like, honestly, sometimes I think people donate to places to almost say, please uh, be the person who is guilty of throwing this out because I feel bad for throwing out this uh, thing I didn't use. Um, so anyway, I really <laughs> don't really like buying things so much and I have a really good like uh, plan for my finances. And I was like, I want to do at least one fun thing, but I can explain away almost any purchase or any fun thing. Cause like I already have a bike, so okay, just keep riding your same bike. I already have this or that. So just use the thing you have at home. You know, that whole meme, like mom, the mom says like, oh, we already have that at home and it's like the worst version or whatever. Um, but then I thought, okay, you know what? I'm in this unique position where horse stuff is really expensive and has all these barriers. But I think I want to try it because this is something that I find really fun and I'm in a position that I can do it. And so I talked to my trainer about it and I was looking for more of a lease because I hadn't owned a horse before and I was really trying to be, <laughs> you'll see why I'm laughing. I was trying to be smart about it, but I wasn't. But also this is how you learn things. Like I said, you go from that unknown, unknown, the things that you don't know that you don't know. And that's where I was in and I was I was aware of that and I was trying my best to be smart about it because I didn't want to end up in a bad situation. Uh, so yeah, so I started with thinking about leases. Could I just lease one for a year? Could I go to a different barn who maybe someone wants to like? And by the way, if you're not familiar with how horse stuff works, it is very common to say, oh, maybe, I don't know, I have an injury this year or I have this decently trained horse around and I don't want to sell them but I would like someone to keep them working and doing uh, interesting productive things so I will lease them for a year for maybe a fee plus you just covering their monthly expenses and uh, yeah and so unfortunately didn't find anything like that because as I've come to learn so much stuff in this world comes down to word of mouth and like, oh yeah, I know so-and-so who their horse hasn't been doing anything in a while. You should talk to them about leasing them for the next year. I'm sure they'd love that. And that's how those things work. It's not, there are places where you can post ads and actually Facebook is absolutely where a lot of horse organization name starts and happens. Uh, but in general, people aren't always putting ads out there. And that's what I've also had to uh, learn a new way of solving problems because with coding, I'm so used to like copying an error message, uh, putting it into search engine, get stack overflow answer and fix something with 30 different solutions that people have upvoted and discussed. Whereas with horses, it's like, huh, my horse just did this crazy thing. How do I fix it? And you get just the scattering of dubious opinions, a couple YouTube videos of trainers trying to like sell you stuff. And then otherwise you just have to ask the people you know, which who knows how much knowledge the people you know have. So it was this very, it very much challenged my anxiety of like wanting to find the best and most awesome solution for things because you don't always have access to all the information in the world. And that included if you're, shopping for a horse, so to speak, uh, the listing sites that are the most convenient to use, that doesn't necessarily mean that's everyone who's out there. And a lot of people won't put their horses up there because most of the time, or not most of the time, but a lot of the time, if people are selling their personal horse, it's not like a trainer that buys a baby, trains it, and then sells it on. Uh, if you're selling your personal horse, you may want to try to keep it within your kind of circle of friends or community as much as possible so that you can keep up with it. You can really vet the people it's going to versus just kind of posting an ad and saying, give me your best offers and stuff like that. Uh, so anyway, I, with all of this in mind and learning all of this, I looked at purchasing a horse to own and just figuring I don't know, <laughs> if someone was in my position, I would say there's a few more things you can do before buying one, but in the end, I have no regrets because I got through all the challenges I'm about to describe. Um, I'm coming out, I've been meaning to make a like some kind of video or 
story time about this for a while, but I was like, I want to make sure it all works out before I make a thing because I want it out a lot of times. Uh, but anyway, and the idea was that I would get a horse that was trained enough for me to ride because, well, I got to kind of an intermediate level at that point. I definitely wasn't, you know, some master rider or anything. And so get a trained horse and then to offset some of the costs, because even though I was able to afford it, uh, the price of board around here, like I said, this area is in the east side has become much more urbanized and the farmlands and barns are starting to either get extremely expensive or close down altogether. So I worked it out with my trainer, like, hey, maybe they could be used as a lesson once or twice a week, and then I could, we could work out a deal there. Um, and I went to see a couple different horses, and one of them uh, probably would have been easier to work with. She was an Arabian who was about 11 years old. She had kind of a different background where she started training as like a driving horse, uh, like pulling carts, but like in a show ring uh, where they just judge Arabians pulling carts. I don't know, that's a world I'm not really as aware of, but that's a thing. And that's where her training started. And somewhere in there when she was younger, she got an aversion to like, if you kind of swatted something near her face, like she'd get very head shy, basically, where she'd get all like, and like jumpy and stuff if you did stuff near her face without being super careful. And then her current owner wasn't the best rider. And she, I won't go into the details, but basically when I wrote her, she seemed super nice, but had all these habits. And I was so unconfident at that time that I was like, I don't know if I can fix all these habits. Well, later on, I realized that I think I got to see her at her quote-unquote worst, which really wasn't that bad, and I totally could have handled her little habits, but I was really trying to be careful. Um, and so then I met this quarter horse, who I have now. Her name's Nova. That's her new name. Her old name used to be Snooky, and I apparently in the horse world people say it's bad luck to change a horse's name and even i saw some people saying i wouldn't sell a horse to someone who wants to change their name it's like genuinely bad luck and i'd be like freaked out of so like all these superstitions uh sorry if people didn't like me changing her name who previously owned her but uh i just couldn't it's like the jersey shore lady girl Snooky. I couldn't do it, but it turned out that she was a little bit more of a Snooky than I thought in terms of <laughs> punching me in the face and things like that. <laughs> She's a bit of a drama queen. Um, but when I first went to see her, it was like I was looking for a little bit of a younger horse. So if you're not aware, it's like zero to six, I would call a horse a baby. Some people would disagree, but basically all of their teeth and bones are still coming in and fusing up until they're six. And to give an idea of kind of the sad state of certain things in racing is like, for example, I think pretty much all race horses are like two or three. So they're extremely young, definitely adolescent. I'd say a two or three year old horse would be like having a bunch of 12 year old kids race around and so it's a lot of stress on their bodies and I won't there's controversies with the racing industry but basically they look full grown but I would say they're still like 12 year old kids at that age and whereas five or six uh once again people have different opinions let's just say it's somewhere between 18 and 24 in human years and then as they start to get to like 15 16 they start to get in a senior age, but can live till they're 30. So for example, the horse I saw that was 11 going on 12, she would start to get in her senior years uh, within a few years of me owning her. And I had seen with the horses I worked with kind of the challenges of caring for a senior horse. Sometimes they need joint supplements. Sometimes they need just more vet appointments, uh, ice packs on their legs, anti-inflammatory things, injections. There's just more complications that come with it. So I was definitely also nervous about that and skewing towards younger horses, which I now realize probably if I 
had rewound and told me at that time, like all the advice I knew now, I would say, still do it because I don't regret the experience in the horse I have now, but anyone in this situation, just get the older horse despite those concerns because it will be worth it if they're trained well and you can enjoy them very quickly after meeting them and moving them to wherever you are. Uh, because, so yeah, so I was looking at younger horses and basically the minimum that we kind of agreed was that four years old was about the minimum that I would consider getting uh, as long as I felt comfortable with them and they seemed like they had a reasonable training foundation. And that's what she seemed like, a uh, snooky at the time. Uh, she had been trained in a Western style and like Western, uh, she was originally Western pleasure, which is where, just look it up on YouTube. In my opinion, they kind of make them go slow it's meant to be like oh this would be the most comfortable and pretty looking ride but i think they over index a little into what judges look for anyway she originally started that then her next owner wanted to do ranch riding which is uh once again look up ranch riding on youtube it's hard to explain it's kind of like obstacles and patterns that you might do if you were on a ranch riding a working horse uh but i guess her, the only issue they really had was that she couldn't really slow down to quite the Western tempo. So they thought, oh, we think she'd be really good for English, for something where she can move more forward and kind of use that energy in a positive way. And yeah, like like I said, I at that time definitely was not a superstar amazing rider, but I was able to get on her, kind of do my thing. I felt comfortable. She seemed super sweet. There were other horses freaking out and she wasn't freaking out. And I later heard a story where like uh, the previous owner's young son was only like six years old. He was leading her around when she was only three years old and another horse freaked out, backed into them and kicked her in the chest and she didn't even react. Like that's something that would be dramatic enough that you think, oh no, the kid's going to get hurt. She's going to bolt into him. She's going to go nuts. And that just, now that we've all settled down, I think that's true to her personality. And that's not common for a horse at all to be as calm and cool, collected, kind of thoughtful and intelligent as she is. She doesn't freak out and have an immediate flight response like a lot of horses. And I actually think looking at her bloodlines that she comes from cow horses, which are like horses that have to herd and cut cattle. Once again, look up on YouTube, like cattle cutting, which is like when uh, a cowboy, a real cowboy <laughs> would need to go and pick one calf, let's say out from the herd, because let's say it's sick, it needs something, maybe it's for slaughter, I don't know. Um, and how do you separate one from the whole herd? You have these super well-trained, super intelligent horses that learn how to kind of cut the calf off from the herd. And then they actually kind of go on autopilot. It's not the rider directing them anymore where they kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And then eventually creep close enough that you can get a rope around it and lead it away. And so I think she has a lot of that in her where she's like super intelligent, super aggressive, like some horses are afraid of cows and they would never work out in that kind of job. And I can tell like she's chased coyotes out of the horse's pasture while they're all going nuts. She like pinned her ears and like went after it. And so that's kind of the mix of her personality. Like when I first went to go look at her to purchase, I think I saw a lot of the sweet, sweet, cool, calm baby energy. Like she had nothing to be dominant over. And then I think, so long story short, I bought her um, because I saw these good positive things and I felt comfortable with her. And the owner was still in the area only 15 minutes away and so I could keep in touch. And basically within a week after she got off the trailer at the place I was at, I think she showed the negative side of all those traits, which is that, it, and, and I think also it was her being separated from people she knew, people that from the time she was a baby, she kind of respected as 
leaders. And I'm going to be careful with that word respect because horses don't really know the word respect, despite what you like internet resources that say things like how to get your horse to respect you. It's really just that they trusted or I'll just use the word they believed that when the previous owner said something, she would believe it and follow through with her. Whereas with me, I hadn't really proven that I was worthy to be trusted, that I wouldn't get her eaten by predators, that um, I would really follow through if I was asking her to do something. And so basically when a horse is in a new situation, they're not like dogs where they can kind of be companions and be equal. Uh, in a herd situation, everyone is higher than lower than everyone else. Um, there is no equal partnership. And while you can be kind and respect the horse and be as soft and sensitive as possible, I had to learn, and that's where I'm at. I wanted to be as soft and sensitive and baby talk and, oh my God, you're so cute, that kind of stuff I love. But I had to learn to be like, I don't want to hurt the horse, but how do I make it really clear that I mean something, especially as she started to become dominant, aggressive, and then straight up dangerous, where she lets a good example is if you lead her to a gate, you undo the gate, maybe it's to her pasture and she's excited to go outside. Maybe it's even just an arena, which she's not particularly excited to go into and open the gate, the door opens. She just would immediately push past you and sort of not bolt, but just <laughs> go ahead of you. Like, thank you for opening the door. I'll be on my way. And at first I thought, oh, we're just working on manners. She's a baby. But I soon learned that, no, that means she's pushing you out of her way. You're not doing anything about it. And so she's just established herself as the higher horse. She's in this new situation where she doesn't know anybody. And she doesn't seem to be very passive or submissive because she seems to be challenging authority and trying to figure out, like, how much can I get away with and how high up on this hierarchy can I be? Like, will anyone actually tell me to knock it off? And, uh, yeah, so this escalated a bit into, well, first I, I learned how to, you know, not make her run in front of me in front of gates, but I still was not a trainer. I didn't have the full experience to know what to do in any given situation. So one of those, for example, early on, uh, was there, we had some neighbors that kept a couple horses in their backyard. It was just like a private house next to this uh, larger boarding place. And one day they brought in a pony and put it in their backyard. And this was actually last year in June on her birthday. I'll have to recall what the exact day was. It was like June 6th or 10th, something like that. <laughs> Sorry, Nova, I forgot your exact birthday. Um, and they had this pony in their backyard. And I was going to go take her out for a little birthday walk. We were just going to do a little loop around the property. I was going to give her treats. I was going to brush her. It was going to be a great day, a great birthday. Um, and I, what, I didn't even know this pony was in their backyard. But as soon as I went and got her and started walking by this fence, it started like shrieking because it was stressed out because it was its first day in this new place. And it wasn't just like neighing or calling out it was like truly had this like stressed shriek and it wasn't in pain it was just kind of running around its little area blowing off steam but for some reason like i said she's usually such a calm collected horse like she doesn't care if dogs are barking she doesn't care if they're coyotes she doesn't spook at things um but for some reason this horse being so stressed out she got really upset about it and so I'm leading her and we go from total calm to like not only is her neck straight up but her tail is up and her haunches are like tense and I've never seen her so tense like she was ready to go and I was trying to use techniques I had learned to kind of get things back under control like one thing for us we did a lot was like backing up moving her out of my space and so we did little things like that, but she kept pushing past me. That That's her MO when I know things are not going well, is when we're just standing still 
and she tries to run forward and ends up running a circle around me and I don't stop it immediately. It's hard to explain, but basically she's pushing past me. She's pushing around me. She's trying to actively get away. She's not just standing quietly. And so then I hear um, someone call from the barn saying like, well, she needs something to do. You should go in the arena, kind of give up on your walk and get her back to thinking about a task so she's not so freaked out about this horse. And I was like, okay, yeah. Um, but I was so tense. And also by this point, I had dealt with some of these behavioral issues for a few months of her being dominant and pushy that I was like, I have to figure this out myself. I can't go over there and ask for help. Uh, I've asked for help so many times at this point, and I know I've probably skipped a lot of stories, but basically I felt like almost every day I was up there, I was having to ask someone for help or pointers or in the first couple of weeks, uh, asking a trainer to like take over before I could move on and do the stuff I needed to do. Um, and I learned the technique, so I thought, okay, I have to do this. It's important I work through this. We go to the arena, uh, but I'm kind of scared because I don't feel in control. She already pushed past me and did circles around me a few times, and I just felt like this isn't good. So I didn't even have the confidence to lead her in there and turn around and close the gate. <laughs> yeah, you can see where this is going. Um, I just thought, okay, We'll walk in. I'm leaving the gate open because hopefully we'll just do a lap and she'll start to calm down. And she actually did. She would start to drop her head and, you know, get more relaxed, be normal again. And then it would let out its like super stressed shriek, like, ah, I'm dying or something. And it, it was not dying. <laughs> um, and then she'd get just as stressed out again, trying to push past me. And it didn't take long. Uh, every time, basically, that I tried to turn her head away from looking at it, and this is where I've learned since different tactics when something's this stressful and she or another horse is really, really intensely looking at something. Uh, pro tip, you don't necessarily need to turn their head away from it if it's deeply stressing them out. It might help that they can look at it. You can back them up. You can kind of do some turns and pivots to give them something that lets them know that you still exist, but not force them to take their head away from it if they think it's something that, I don't know, maybe they're thinking it's potentially dangerous. It's something that they need to be fixated on. Um, anyway, so I pulled her head away from it and said, you know, kind of trying to be the confident person I was told I should be, like, knock it off, stop fixating on that, let's go do something productive. And maybe the second time I did that, it was like she just went full nuclear. She was just like, F you, I'm freaking out. I already pushed past you like five or six times and you didn't really do anything about it. I think also she had been like rearing and stuff where I was trying to stay calm, but I didn't really address. So lots of things that I did wrong here. Um, but also I wasn't a total basket case who didn't know what I was doing. So it was that in-between phase where unfortunately there were a lot of unknown unknowns and there were a lot of things I did know, but I wasn't good enough because she went full nuclear. She spun around, bolted. She like knew the gate was open, honestly, spun around, bolted and kicked me right in the, I don't even know how it worked out, but I had two, I'm not even kidding hoof print shaped massive bruises on my legs later on. And then I definitely fractured my ribs. So I don't know if she kicked me in the thighs and they kind of clipped my ribs or something like that. But she just, this is why I said she's kind of a snooky. She punched me in the face and ran out and like needed to say hi to this horse. And what's so interesting is that this has never come up. And I mean, we've worked a ton on our relationship and behavioral training and her dominance and stuff like that. And I, we've also come across a lot of different stressed horses and a lot of different very distracting or disconcerting things. She's never even come close to being as stressed as this. So that's where I don't know if it was a combination of my lack of trainer skills uh, and that this was just some fluky thing. Like, I don't know if she thought this horse was like a friend she knew and that might sound ridiculous, but honestly, she 
has a friend right now that's a white horse and sometimes she'll see white horses and I can tell she's like trying to figure out if it's her friend or not. Um, yeah, I don't know what was the trigger and even asking trainers who were there and picked me up off of the ground <laughs> afterwards uh, and called my boyfriend to take me to the ER to get pain meds. Uh, I asked them after, like, like, here's exactly what happened play by play. And it was basically, yeah, there was more you could have done to address it. But also, this seemed to be a very weird trigger where maybe even a trainer wouldn't necessarily have addressed it better. And we kind of maybe should have just closed the door of the arena. And while this isn't something you should normally do, if she was that stressed out, just let her loose and sort of run off some steam if she's really getting that uh, crazy. And since then, we've never gotten to that point, And that's why I say I don't recommend just saying, I can't control my horse. Put them in a place and let them run crazy. I don't think that's the right way to train or operate. But anyway, yeah. So I was in the ER and I remember trying so hard to hold it together and like not cry and just be like, like, you know, I'm kicked, I'm on the ground, I'm, like, trying slowly to get up and just being like, oh, this sucks. And then as soon as my boyfriend came and got me and I got in the car and I just started crying and the pain really set in and, yeah, basically I was fine in the end, fractured some ribs, had really deep, deep bruising in my muscles, but everything was fine and I just needed pain meds for one night. And I think even he was really scared because the nurses was, were saying that I'd feel like I got literally hit by a car, which is true. The impact is very similar to getting hit by a car in like, if like a very specific car in my thighs, if that makes sense. Like not necessarily, ah, I don't want to compare like that it was as bad as a car accident, but the impact is all, is all I'm saying. The impact on my legs was kind of similar to um, a car. And similarly, uh, falling off of a horse that's running at a full gallop is kind of like falling out of a car running at like 20, 30 miles an hour, which also happened to me a little bit later. So <laughs> yeah, horses, they can hurt you. And that's where I've learned to take absolutely every precaution to make sure it never gets to that point. But anyways, that's that's jumping ahead. We still had plenty of issues uh, all the way through last summer. So that was in June. And we had been making actually really amazing progress March through June. The dominance issues came up, and I felt like I was working through it. And then that happened. And uh, I now had this new problem of just total like primal fear where I actually intellectually knew like, hey, that was a really specific trigger. She's never threatened to kick. I've even seen her like when before I owned her with little kids around her and she was never like aggressive in that way. Um, like even when I say she has dominance issues, it's more of that she just has this big personality and wants to like kind of push you around, but she wasn't she was never aggressive in a way that wanted to harm you. Uh, but even then, I still had this physical fear where I didn't want to get anywhere near her hind end. I'd start shaking when I'd go, not just go into her stall, but when I'd like drive up to the horse place and I'd pull in, I would start to like shake and need to like hype myself up to go in there. And uh, I was afraid to even take her out to like a pasture alone. Just all basic things became super hard again after they were already hard to begin with. And uh, I intellectually knew she's not going to do anything. But at the same time, that came out of the blue and I'd only known her for three months. So I'm like, maybe there's a lot I still don't know about her. Um, and at this point, she had also done things like when lunging, which is when you have them on the ground on a line and you're exercising them around you. She had bolted a couple of times in a way that wasn't just her kind of playing and getting some energy, but where it seemed like she was trying to intimidate me, like she was full galloping, like NASCAR style, like on an angle going nuts and like bucking and really being intimidating, successfully intimidating. Um, 
and a couple times I was writing and yeah when I was when she was saying I don't want to go that way and I was trying to do what I was supposed to do and be like nope we're going that way and sometimes she would be like all right and then sometimes it was like "Mm, no I don't think I want to and once again she would take the nuclear option of just bolting off and I was proud I guess because I actually stayed on for four out of five bolts Uh, but then as we got to September once again we had overcome I'm skipping a lot but we had overcome the issue of the kicking I was no longer afraid of working with her on the ground I could do all of my normal things with no fear but riding was still um not great. And this is also a moment to say that I spent tons of time, maybe six months, just on the ground doing exercises to build our relationship, to manage the dominance issues, to feel more confident that um, I can actually, if she starts bolting, that I can control it from the ground. But when riding, I still wasn't confident yet. And um, yeah, one day, it was in September, she wanted to dive for some grass in an outdoor riding area. And I said, no, you can't. And then she was like, okay, but I'm not happy about that. And then that happened another time. And once again, instead of, you know, moving on from it, I said, no, you can't have grass. And she's like, all right, I feel like I'm going to go full nuclear again. And she just went galloping off and it was an extremely disappointing day. I That was the one time I fell off after being able to sit most of her nonsense and stay on and work through it. And, you know, I felt like I had already worked through so much and had to gain so much confidence I didn't know I had and learned so much in such a short time. Once again, going from kind of beginner intermediate rider to sort of crash course in being a horse trainer for a young horse. This is where, once again, I'm going back to please get an older one if it's your first horse. But um, anyway, yeah, so I fell off and just had a little bruise on my back. It wasn't a big deal, even though it hurt a lot, but it really hurt my ego. And just, it was just an exhausting feeling to be like, oh my gosh, we've been through so much. I got kicked in the, kicked in the torso and got over that fear and I was able to get on and ride and start training again and now we're back here again we're bolting again we're getting like mad over things that's the main thing is that she hasn't gotten scared of things um she doesn't she can be amazing to work with when she's on board but it's like she still had that idea in her of if I really don't like something uh I can take this nuclear option and basically tell everyone to F off. Uh, But it was almost a good thing. I didn't have the saddle secured as tightly as I should have, which is kind of, uh, which is bad for safety because I could have just slid off the saddle in a bad way. But in this case, it was almost good because as soon as I fell off, she was running hard enough that the saddle slipped and rotated under her belly which freaked her out a ton because I doubt that's ever happened in her entire life. And so I say that's good because I wanted her not to think I dumped my rider and now I got to go eat grass. But instead I dumped my rider and then the saddle did this crazy thing and I don't ever want to do that again. That's what I hope has stuck in her mind because she hasn't done that since. Um, But yeah, we got her and I got back on. And I was crying. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, is this going to work out? Like, I feel so stupid. And I was trying so hard to avoid looking stupid. And as you guys could even hear from my preamble of like, why I haven't been making videos, I think a big limiter in my life in the past few years, or maybe my whole entire life, has been not wanting to look stupid or wanting things to work out really well or kind of wanting to have yeah, just kind of this idea of, I don't even think of myself as a perfectionist, but I think that's secretly what I'm hoping for, that everything will just be perfect and go great, and that mistakes, um, that I just don't want to make mistakes, that I don't trust that I'll correct mistakes and everything will be fine. I didn't have that sort of confidence in myself. And that's what this all really uh, went back to, but anyways... 
I was really concerned whether this would work out or not. I was fully aware, like, ah, I'm just really, you know, I'm not experienced enough for this. Like, that's crazy. Like, if I asked any random person, do you think you could train a young horse to learn how to be ridden? I, the average person would be like, no way. And that's probably where I would have been at if I knew this was the journey that I was going to take when I bought her. And it was so mystifying because I was like, I'm not, I wasn't an amazing rider when I first got her and when I was first like looking at her uh, and somehow I was able to ride her just fine with no coaching and no advice or anything and she was great. And by the way, I really, I kept in contact with the previous owners. I don't think there was any foul play or like drugging or anything like that because even we've touched base since then they've come to visit her had long conversations about like that's so weird that she was doing that like i've and even to diagnose besides the fact that she was a more dominant personality looking to sort of challenge the hierarchy i think another aspect is just uh horses between the age of like let's say four and seven it seems like they go from I'm a baby and I'm learning some different stuff about working with humans and this is also new and interesting and fun and I kind of get to play and then between four and seven it's like okay you're starting to become an adult honestly it's just like teenagers and middle schoolers where there's a rebellious streak of like wait now I have to grow up and do a job for real uh this kind of stinks before I got to play around a bit and I'm gonna see how much I can get away with and I think that's all there is to it. But the difficulty is that horses are very big and very dangerous. And if you don't know how to speak horse and you attach too many human emotions to their brain, which is not capable of some human emotions that people attach to them. Uh, yeah, you're just going to end up with a bad, a bad time. And so I would say September through... December were some pretty hard months where I like knuckled down and by the way also I was having a trainer work with her and ride her throughout this uh along with me so it's not like I was just saying oh I'm doing this all by myself I had lots of help already and that's what was so disappointing is that I already had a lot of help and I already put in so much of my own time being there almost every day like even on her day off, like making sure we still do something, we interact, we have good manners and all these things. And then I said, okay, I'm going to sort of treat this honestly like a software problem where I'm going to unit test the horse, where if we're not stopping perfectly and promptly, then we can't like walk forward because why would we walk forward if we can't stop perfectly and so on and build on those principles and that's actually a good way to think about training and to even just think about any project or process in general like find your base case building block and then move on from there and if your base case is not doing well then you shouldn't just move on to more advanced things till your basics are down really well and that's a good principle to have but i was also uh like okay i just won't ride her because i don't want to screw her up uh, i'm only going to have the trainer ride her i will do stuff on the ground and i will make sure our ground stuff is just so amazing like we'll do these different turns and patterns with like precision. When I lunge her, she'll know voice commands, hand signals, we'll be super in tune. We'll do liberty training, which is when you have them totally loose and they're just uh, following you and following your cues without being attached to any equipment. And we actually did do all those things and that was pretty cool. Like we got to an awesome place on the ground where I was no longer afraid of her where her bolting and NASCAR racing around me was no longer scary. It was something I could control and tell her to knock off. Uh, if I was, you know, I learned that you can stand in front of a galloping horse and they probably won't run you over. They, that, they actually might pivot and turn around. And that's a scary thing to have to learn and practice over and over. But, uh, I learned how to make sure she never runs from me in the pasture and that she learns to come to me. Like there are all these things that you don't think about 
in horse ownership that I would say encompass like what horsemanship really means and what I think all people, uh, I actually think all people, not just horsey people, should experience some of this because it was like the most focused form of like primal communication. Like it really forces you to focus on I think as humans, we have so much in our frontal lobes, like things that are very abstract and in our heads. And that's where a lot of anxiety can come from, like thinking, if this happens, then this might happen. And if I could get this, then maybe I'd feel like this. And horses have none of that. Like they really don't have that frontal lobe in their brain. And that's why when people say, oh, that horse, uh, he's a real prankster, like that's not ever usually what's happening, like horses can seem to express human personalities, but there are certain things they do. For example, they look like they're kissing you. That may not really be kissing you and being sweet. That actually may even be them nibbling you and thinking of you as chopped liver. Like if Nova starts like biting me, I know she thinks that she can get away with that. And that's actually uh, a negative thing if she kind of does the kissy face because that means she thinks she can eat me and be naughty and things like that. Uh, it is cute, but also I've noticed a lot of things that are cute are actually bad behaviors. Anyway, so we assign a lot of things to horses that aren't real and that's also where horses can get into some bad situations because you hear things like, oh, that horse is acting up because he needs to learn respect. And it's like, those are very human things. And there might be some horsey principles in there, but the horse doesn't really know respect. It knows things like body language. It knows things like, this is my space, this is your space. If you come into my space, will I move out of your way or will I challenge you for it? Like there's things like that that they understand uh, be because that's what they would use to survive in a herd setting. Anyway, going back to where I was at, I don't think I'll quite pick up the thread of wherever I left off. But uh, yeah, so we did some awesome stuff on the ground working on this communication. Clearly, I read way too many like forum posts and books. And this is what I mean when I said that like, this was terrible for my anxiety and how I like to solve problems because I, I probably read every thread like, like, is this a five-year-old horse issue? Is this a quarter horse issue? Uh, looking up like dominant mare issues, bolting horse issues, watching every YouTube video, um, just all kinds of things that really don't help because basically what I have to do is I have to actually go there, see how she is that day, see what she's gonna give me. And even then, if I'm brushing her off, she might be giving me the meanest, nastiest faces ever. Like F you, I don't wanna do anything with you, whatever. And then we have an awesome time riding. Or there were some days, like the day she bolted and the day she kicked me, uh, where she was absolutely sweet and so cute and nice. You know, once again, brushing her, she seems to be like, you know, moving her head around like, ooh, I like you itching me there, like being very affectionate. And then, you know, something terrible happens right after that. So I had to learn, look, don't just sit at home reading a bunch of stuff and getting all worried and wondering if things are this or that. Uh, you have to go there. You have to see how she is. And even then, you have to deal with things moment to moment because horses aren't like people where we have kind of this longer term mood. They're very much moment to moment. Um, and then, yeah, something I, as I started to realize a lot of the things that I'm talking about um, and the biggest one being... Uh, getting over, once again, another fear of riding her and being worried that I'm going to screw her up if I don't do things right. And having a lot of those known unknowns where I'm like, I'm aware when my body position is bad, but I'm not able to always correct it fast enough. And uh, even just feeling like the stakes are really high, like this was a very expensive decision. And also I don't want to just sell this animal because I'm attached to her, but also what if the previous owners can't take her back because they can't afford to? What if, uh, you know, I don't want to sell her on to someone random. I don't want to sell her saying she has known issues because she could end up in a worse place than she is now if they're not willing to really work on these behavioral issues because no one wants to buy a horse 
you know, with lots of issues, you want to buy a horse that's trained or that's won competitions and stuff like that. Uh, so I was like, oh, I just, I have to figure this out. And that really pushed me way past my comfort zone and pushed me to kind of have this like spiritual journey. It pushed me into finally a couple weeks after that fall happened, going into therapy for all sorts of different things. It wasn't just this that I was anxious about. Clearly, like clearly this is another huge thing I've learned. The horse is a reflection of yourself. Um, and that's really true if you meet lots of different horse and owner pairings. Uh, and that a lot of her fussiness was due to my anxiety and not being able to even give her the confidence that everything was great. And if she was going to do something that I would definitely have an answer for it. And yeah, so I went into therapy. I, um talked through the horse stuff. I talked through a lot of different family stuff and different stressors going on. And it felt like I was just able to validate, validate lots of feelings. And I think the biggest thing was identifying things that, in her words, I was dragging with me past their time. Like things from, I'm 26 now, and it was basically like, hey, things from childhood, from high school, from college, like you don't have to forget about them, but you can kind of draw a clear line. Like you're on a new chapter. Uh, you don't need to drag stuff with you. And there was stuff that I thought, man, I'll always be sad about this. Like I'm pretty sure I'll always be sad about certain things that happened. And even just realizing, no, you can actually, you can still respect them and be okay but you don't have to drag that sadness actively into your current day-to-day. -day. And that helped a lot. The other thing that helped was massively lowering my expectations down. If I actually, if I had to give the primary technique that got me over the physical fear after being kicked, after being thrown off, uh, it was lowering my expectations down to my comfort zone because I started to realize um, that I was one that felt like, you know, I was scared to <laughs> trot with her for a bit, which is just, it's the gait uh, that's a little bit faster than walking, but we had had some issues with it and her getting fussy and things. So I was kind of afraid to do it. And I was of the mindset, like, I just have to get on. I have to do it. I have to push through it. And that's the kind of person I was. And I realized even through working through other issues and thoughts and emotions I had that I can way, way lower my expectations. And I can allow myself to operate in what I call the lime green zone. So if the green zone is like your ultimate comfort zone, you're not learning or developing anything. It's like where you're having fun. Like if you've ever played a musical instrument, it's like playing the song that you know over and over. The yellow zone is where you start to feel a little bit more of that chaos of things that you don't know and you don't quite feel comfortable and you may not even be having a lot of fun when you're in your yellow zone. And then obviously red zone in the context of horses would be like, oh my God, I feel like I'm in danger. So that's where between green and yellow, lime green means I feel comfortable and I'm able to even have a little fun with it, but I'm pushing myself to the next little baby step. And I think throughout my whole life, I always felt like just letting myself stay, letting myself be comfortable, or you could even say by extension, like loving myself and caring for my own happiness and well-being was definitely secondary. And it was kind of like, you know, don't be lazy, like go for the hard class, go for the hard degree, go for the hard thing just because you can. And I'll... I'll be disappointed in myself if I give up just because it's like a character flaw or something like that. I don't know. Looking back, I'm like, wow, I was kind of crazy. Um, or I don't know who I was trying to prove to. Probably, once again, something in my childhood therapy, etc. cetera. Um, and I just realized with the horse, like, 
she will not meet me halfway. Like she is a horse and actually she's a young horse and I need to be in a position where whatever I'm asking her to do, I have the full skills to do because I need to guide her and I need to meet her all of the way. She's not going to meet me halfway. Uh, so the only place I can operate in is my green zone or lime green zone because anything after that will confuse both her and me. So it was this really sort of magical thing that was probably the only activity that would have actually pushed me to go to therapy and realize that it's okay to turn down the expectations for myself. Um, because the stakes, once again, of having a living, breathing, adorable animal that is in my care and me wanting to give her the best life possible and not give up on her. And yeah, this all really started to click for me in about December, where there are a few times where I tried to do some goals with riding that were more in my yellow zone. And it was because I was really trying to push myself. I was like, this has to work out. You know, the stakes are high. And Afterwards, I had just this huge feeling of adrenaline and not in a good way, like in a, uh, I was trying to keep my body so relaxed and in the perfect position that all of the anxiety left my hip and my shoulder and all these tight areas. And it was just collecting in my, like, inside, like in my stomach, in my throat. And over the next month, I battled with, even as I was, you know, driving to go to the horse place, uh, remembering that negative adrenaline and feeling like, oh, I have to like pump myself up to do these really hard yellow zone, red zone uh, tasks and accomplish these goals in the schedule I wanted to set for myself to prove that this whole horse thing could work out. And uh, I was battling with this anxiety ooze, like if it went into my throat, uh, I'd do some breathing, I'd get it out of my throat, and then it would go to my stomach and I'd feel nauseous or I'd get a headache or obviously my body would tighten as I'm on the horse or something like that. And this is where I can totally understand how in uh, medieval times people thought that mentally ill people were possessed by demons because uh, I felt like there was just some some physical thing that was running around my body. And it all came to a head one day when I just had a very minor incident happen, like something super minor that if on a normal day right now, I wouldn't even think twice about. And my like mind just exploded. Like I couldn't handle the minor stress of this small thing. And I remember we went to, what was it? Rave and I went to this like electrical hardware store. He was doing some project with like a Raspberry Pi and we went to this electrical store. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, it's been so, so long since uh, I've been in a store and I just had this sinking feeling of like, oh my God, I'm like not okay. Like I just don't feel okay. I feel kind of de-realized, depersonalized. The world feels like it's ending and I don't know why. And I haven't felt like that in so long. I used to struggle with different things <laughs> when I was younger and a teenager. And that's what it felt like. It felt like, oh my God, I'm a teenager again and I'm falling apart. And uh, that was when I really was like, okay, this is clear that I can't just keep pushing myself because these are very physical signals that this won't work out. And I think it's difficult because I've been in a system that's rewarded me doing those intense pushes and saying, I'm not gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna be a weakling. I'm gonna do the hard thing because it's the thing I should do. Um, and yeah, like I went to a competitive high school. I was in a competitive college program. I then entered a competitive job, you could say, as a college grad. And so there were lots of these checkpoints that rewarded you for a lot of short-term, uh, like short-term pushes of energy where, you know, you pull an all-nighter to study for the test. You get a project done, not enough that like a customer would use it, but enough that the auto grading system 
says you got 100%. Like, yeah. And so that's where I was really sad and emotional because I wish there was someone along the way to say, look, so much of this doesn't matter and won't be useful for you when you need to have a mindset of, when I say the real world, I don't even mean like, I'm, I'm not saying the typical things that adults say of like, get a real job, but even just the mindset you have to have in a real job is to, let's say in software, support customers for many years, have long-term thinking, have sustainable schedules for you and your employees, uh, not to just get an exam done and churn it out. And I think that's why uh, you could argue there's varying quality qualities in software that you see out there today because I think it depends. It depends on the culture of the team making it. If they value these more long-term, I'd argue like lime green zone approach to software development, or if they value just uh, getting things done fast and dirty. And there's different ways to use either one. And I can talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, I was very emotional because I wish someone told me like, hey, it's okay to not expend maximal effort all the time. And it's not normal to wake up and instantly feel your heart beat as it prepares for the tasks you have to do that day. Like, that's not normal. And I said thank you to the primal part of my brain because my anxiety is something that's like if I was a human in the wild and this is where I thank horses for reminding us of our role as like like apex predators and that they are prey animals like it reminds you of these primal things in your brain I think that's what I was trying to get at when I talked about the horse's brain earlier I'm all over the place but uh reminding myself that as this apex predator out in some forest uh, that if I'm trying to survive, I need something in my brain to panic and send chemicals when it thinks something's wrong. And when you're very insulated or you're just in these societies that have very abstract ideas of what survival is, like for example, even if, uh, let's just say, uh, you don't have a job and there's no way you can get a job and you're totally off the grid. If you have a healthy working body, you technically can like go to like that. Who is that guy who like actually does subsistence hunting in Alaska for like years on end? And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people who do this, but this was like a guy who grew up in quote unquote normal America and learn the skills to go and do this like technically we could all learn to do that I don't think unfortunately there's enough wildlife to sustain that for everyone but we forget that like I think some people when they think about surviving at that basic level it's easy for your brain to shut down and say like, oh no I could never do that and instead you've calibrated your anxieties to be like you know very understandably by the way I'm not criticizing people uh but to say, well, losing my job would be catastrophic enough that my brain might associate that with like lack of survival or death. Um, but even, like I said, I was in competitive programs where it felt like genuinely getting anything less than an A, uh, like an A grade, was catastrophic enough that it would trigger your <laughs> death anxiety uh, because you truly believe that you needed to be the best to like be okay in life and I'm sure there's many other systems uh, that apply here but this has been the biggest thing for me is getting out of those abstract human -y systems and remembering like who we are as animals the parts of psychology and neurology that we have in common with animals and Learning how to communicate in that way is extremely grounding. And that doesn't mean I plan on subsistence hunting in Alaska now. Uh, I'm still on the grid, so to speak, but it reminds me of things like what is actually important to survival that I'd like my stress chemicals to kick off for? And what are things that I can thank my brain for trying to help, but that's not actually where I need to calibrate to? Um, yeah, so that's what I struggled with in December, and then finally let things go. Um, and I remember it was New Year's Day in January. I went out for a ride, and 
we had terrible weather in Seattle this year. We actually did not have a super rainy winter like the year before and the year before that. And then this year, it was like, I think every day in January, almost, it rained. Uh, but miraculously, New Year's Day, it was this beautiful sunny day. It was one of the first days of winter where I didn't need to have that many layers on. And it felt like this fresh start where I was like, whoa, like if I just get on and walk around, like that's good enough as long as we just did one tiny extra thing that day that we learned more than before. And it was mind blowing to me. I was like, whoa, when I do yoga or exercise, I don't have to strain to be like when they say, okay, fold down and like try to touch your toes. I don't have to be like, oh, I'm going to touch my toes because I need to do it. It's like, oh, I can just hang out. And as long as I'm generally stretching my hamstrings, I'm getting most of the benefit without immediately burning myself out and thinking, wow, yoga is so hard. I'm not doing that ever again, which is the reason why I didn't do it regularly, because I think I tried too hard every time I did it. Um, and yeah, I realized how much more I can get done by not trying hard every day, if that makes sense. Consistency over raw, crazy effort. Um, and then by the end of February, this is where I said the one year mark was the middle of March, around my birthday, actually. And I said, if we're not, you know, if I'm not able to walk around and trot with her by my birthday, uh, by mid-March, the one-year mark, I need to figure something out or we need to understand why this isn't working out. Uh, and once again, not because I'm like selfishly like, I need to ride this horse and whatnot, but it was even for our own well-being. Horses that are trained with no behavioral issues will generally have a better life than ones that have issues and can't be ridden by normal people like me. Um, and it was just this amazing thing where uh, it didn't happen randomly. It didn't happen through luck. It really was just putting the work in, the fact that I still showed up despite, you know, shaking in fear, despite, you know, being in emotional therapy, still in physical therapy to work on my asymmetry, um, you know, working on all this stuff through this super rainy, terrible, dark, honestly, winter. Um, and then one day I was like, you know what? I feel ready. I feel like I have the tools. And the thing I've been scared to do because it resulted in a couple bolts over the last year was just trotting and, uh, yeah, at the end of February, there was just one day where I was like, I'm just going to do it. And we did it. And she did it a really nice, soft, slow one. She didn't have any of the tension that she did a few months before when I had last tried it and it didn't work out so well. And I immediately just, we took like three steps of that. I stopped and I just immediately started crying and I feel like there's actually there are a few things that I think have made me like that emotional and proud because it was such a genuine achievement like there was no way that someone was just you know letting me off the hook to make me feel better because they felt like pity or sympathy it wasn't like a bs testing system that was designed by some corporation like it was just so genuinely like, oh man, like we did this. And while I could have pushed it to just say, I need to get on and do this and just figure it out. We put in so much work to make it this pleasant experience where I really felt confident in my skills and in her like communication with me that, yeah, it was just so special. And I went to the grocery store that day. I went to the expensive grocery store and I got all of the snacks I wanted. And that was my reward. Um, and she got a lot of treats and grass and good things too that day. Uh, and then a couple weeks later, it was crazy. I had done this big milestone. And then for various reasons, I had to move barns that we were boarding at with my trainer. And we were worried, like, man, we got to this good place. You know, she might get to this new barn and exhibit similar behaviors that she did before. Because once again, new environment, need to challenge authority, figure out who all these other new horses are. 
And yeah, we've been there for almost a month now, and she's been great, and we picked up where we left off. Uh, just today, I had her uh, in a round pen, and we were doing Liberty stuff, and she fully followed all of, like, we hadn't done this in months. She followed all of the same hand signals. She never once misbehaved. We've been doing our same riding and even getting more advanced. Like, it's just been super awesome, and... I feel like I, yeah, I just have learned so many lessons through this experience that I just wanted to make something to talk about it with others, not only to explain what I've been doing while I've been gone, but also I think things that have been limiting me from not just creating YouTube content, but just creating in general and really getting in my head and once again, self-filtering rather than just saying, well, for example, let's say I'm trying to write a story. I'll just write a crappy story like uh, there was once a girl with a pony, the girl's hair was brown and the pony was brown. Like, you know, just start with simple sentences and just let your story go. Instead, I'd be like, what are words for brown? Like, okay, these are all the different ways a horse can be. It can be a bay. It can be a chestnut. What about the girl's hair? you know, I just get caught up on the dumbest details and that I realized was kind of the story of my life in every single way. So that's why I'm making this video and a uh, video podcast recording, whatever. Um, and so if this was kind of rambly, I'm sorry. This is me just trying to get over that mental hurdle. But also I hope that the story was interesting or that there is at least a thread that you related to um, I also hope that, uh, I don't know, equestrian sports or horsemanship can be less of this weird niche elitist thing and that we can continue to keep, keep it alive and not just for the sake of like competition and things like that, but to really teach people how to communicate with an animal that is very special because they're not like dogs. They don't want your love and affection to like be uh, secure, if that makes sense. They need a leader and not all horses will be super affectionate and loving like Nova really wasn't for a while. Um, and, you know, how do you work through that completely different way of communication uh, and that unequal hierarchy. So, yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know what the future of this channel is. I've been trying to use this quarantine time to maybe, for example, start doing some of that unfiltered creativity, which means just, you know, making lots of, let's just say, bad stuff, bad stories, bad drawings, bad podcasty videos. And then trying to, you know, make something good. Try, try to polish the turds, so to speak. That's how I feel like this last year was with Nova. We, we polished a turd. Both of us were turds in different ways. Probably more me than her. But we're, we've polished ourselves into something that resembles, <laughs> I don't know, something else. Um, anyway... I could talk about things I've learned about horses and horse metaphors forever. And who knows, I might have some higher quality videos that explain some of the principles I talked about here. Um, and that hopefully maybe even will include the software project, the little engine thing I mentioned I was working on. But I'm not too concerned and I'm not going to make stuff unless uh, I'm really interested because I'm just too busy and I'm trying to take it take it easy and keep things in that green comfort zone and not force myself to make or post things. So anyway, uh, hope you guys are doing well, that some of this was interesting, some of it was relatable, uh, and have a happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys next time.